I'm um, dealing with the uh, sociology, the social structure of the present-day Hungarian society. And uh, it's um, the, the research institute that I'm, uh, what I'm uh, be part of um, uh, tries to understand the social structure of the present-day Hungary. But in order to understand it, we sometimes need to, need to extend our scope towards uh, backwards in time or uh, further away in space. And that's what I would like to use these 20 minutes to do in four different aspects that might be important. The first is the social structure. The second is uh, values and attitudes. The third is social capital and collective action. And the fourth is identity and geopolitical orientation of the Hungarians. And finally, I would like to try to conclude how things come together. Now let's start with the social structure. If one uh, observes the current structure of the Hungarian society, then we see in international comparisons that um, in terms of inequalities, um, it uh, fits somewhere in the middle of the league of the, Hungary, uh, of the European countries. In uh, many countries, inequalities are larger. Many countries, inequality, the inequalities are smaller. What is a sort of a peculiarity for the first uh, glance is the weakness and narrowness of the middle classes and uh, the size of the large deprived segment of the society. Part of it can be considered as underclass. Part of it is simply in terms of incomes, it may be, I mean, there is always a middle of the income distribution, but in terms of uh, strengths and vulnerability, strengths or vulnerability of the households, it's, it, it cannot be considered to be a middle class, but, large, but more like a deprived uh, part of the society. Um, actually, um, I think this is, uh, this is a very important characteristic of the, of the current Hungarian society, but the history of it can, can go back to, to, uh, to uh, uh, to the f too far in the history. Um, when one compares the, I, I just would like to use two slides to explain what do I mean by the uh, narrow and weak middle classes. One is the relative position of the Hungarian middle class as compared to the various European, European other countries. We see the, the red line shows the upper middle class, the threshold for the upper middle class, uh, which, uh, uh, which hardly reaches uh, the, the, the level of the poor in terms of incomes in many of the Western European, European societies. And if one takes a look at uh, the various uh, um, uh, sociological items um, what can be used to characterize deprivation in Hungary, one would see that those in the middle uh, have uh, all sorts of uh, um, uh, problems with their everyday, everyday life to meet uh, uh, meet uh, their needs. Um, if uh, I, I don't want to, to 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 deal too much with the data, but we uh, we can conclude that uh, traditionally, what is what is what can be understood as uh, as middle class um, with uh, uh, fair enough uh, income stream with uh, with uh, reserves to be able to pay for uh, the kids' higher education or with reserves for, uh, for the rainy days, then we would see that fairly large part of the middle classes cannot afford that. So the traditionally understood middle class starts somewhere uh, from the bottom up at the two thirds, two thirds of the society. Okay, so what, um, uh, what can we say if we turn back in history and try to explain why the Hungarian middle class is so weak and so narrow? The first answer is it's never been strong because the, prior to the Second World War, um, there was an extreme wealth and land concentration. There was a back, backward economic structure and uh, the, uh, the middle class was not strong that, at that time either. Then came the Second World War with all sorts of destruction of uh, the middle classes, uh, first the Nazis, then the communists uh, after the Second World War. Then uh, in the communist period, the utopia of the classless society and the uh, forced mobility of masses with giving hope to masses to sustain um, uh, 
the acceptance of the, uh, of the Russian occupation of the time, then it led to, uh, uh, to a society where uh, most of the people became, uh, became uh, I mean, inequalities obviously decreased, at least to some extent in, in certain spheres of life, but there has been a widespread status inconsistency and where one cannot really speak about uh, uh, consistent middle classes. But this is only part of the story. The second part of the story comes at the transition. So if one, if one takes a look at the current structure of the Hungarian society, we also have to understand the, uh, the factors affecting the sides and strengths of the middle classes after the transition. Uh, I listed uh, four different factors that contributed to the, to the current situation. Uh, one is privatization. The way how privatization went on, it did not really help uh, the building up of uh, the national uh, national uh, uh, bourgeoisie or, uh, or uh, middle class. The the, 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 a large part of the privatization was motivated by the huge debt legacy from socialism. Uh, it was dominated by management buyouts and high-speed uh, large-scale uh, large uh, sales. Uh, and there was a very slow and hesitant development of uh, homegrown, homegrown enterprises. The second is that uh, the transition uh, also involved a transition to a very low level of uh, employment uh, equilibrium. So there were a large drop of employment. Many people dropped out of the labor force and then they became the source of that large deprived part of the society, which what we talk about now. The third is that uh, in many of the, uh, I mean, in, in the competitive sector of the economy, there was a, a massive modernization, but uh, this was not the case in the state sectors, neither in health nor in, nor in education. And the health and education employment is always a, a very important part of, uh, of the, uh, as, a source of, uh, as a source of middle classes. Um, so there are a number of factors behind the weak and, uh, and narrow middle classes. My second topic, I have to rush a little bit, my second topic is about the values and attitude surveys uh, which demonstrate uh, that the Hungarian, uh, the Hungarian society um, in many respects is uh, closed. Sometimes it can even be called a xenophobic and introvertal society. The level of social trust, especially in institutions, is fairly low in international comparisons uh, and it was low prior, uh, I mean, it was low at the beginning of the, uh, of the transition as, uh, uh, as well. There is a great dose of hypocrisy regarding the corrupt behavior. It's always the others whom we, uh, whom we consider as corrupt and, never, and norm breakers, never us. And this, uh, there are many, uh, plenty of uh, sociological uh, surveys uh, proving that. There is a very low, which is a peculiarity of the Hungarian society, there is a very low tolerance of inequality. Uh, uh, many of the Hungarians consider society as unjust, perceive economy as a zero-sum game. Uh, therefore, they think that uh, getting ahead can always uh, uh, be achieved only at the expense of uh, some of the others. And uh, uh, a fourth uh, important characteristic is that paternalism and infantilism uh, appear at the same time. It's partly coming from the past, uh, from the socialist legacy, but it's also, it's also been continued during the transition years when the transition created large uh, uh, groups of the society dependent on state, uh, state benefits, uh, and this uh, helped continuing this attitude in the, uh, in the uh, society. Uh, so if one takes a look at, uh, there, is, there is a famous value map of the world by the World Value Survey researchers, Ronald Ingehart, uh, who, um, uh, whose uh, research makes it possible to, to put the uh, attitude structures of the various, various uh, societies. And when we did that in 2009, we, we, we found that Hungary, the Hungarian attitude and value structure is far from the core of the Western European culture. It's more secular than predicted by the level of economic development. Uh, and more close than the center of the value of the Western values. And we first, uh, first when we first published our study, then it was a shock for the Hungarian public uh, because we said that the attitude structure is similar to those of uh, Bulgaria, Moldova, and, uh, and Russia. 
But later on, if someone takes a look at the map, I will, uh, the geographic map, map you will uh, see similar things that the neighbors are uh, roughly these countries. But uh, I, will, I will turn back to this issue a bit later. Yes? Um, yes, uh, sorry, okay. Um, uh, you can put, uh, I mean, this, uh, this value, value map uh, puts uh, societies into a coordinate, uh, uh, by, by two coordinates. One is uh, closed and open thinking, uh, closed and open, uh, more, more, toler more tolerant or less tolerant uh, toward the other, towards the others uh, and towards uh, the society. And the other, uh, the other axis, the vertical axis, is about traditional and modern, uh, modern, uh, modern values. Um, in, dur during the question and answer session, I can explain more uh, the elements of these. So these traditionalism and modernity and closed and open thinking. And uh, uh, you see uh, Hungar Hungarians uh, would like to belong uh, to, the, to the upper, uh, upper right corner of this, uh, of this coordinate uh, system. But, but when you take a look at uh, their values uh, and attitudes, you don't find them there. Okay, uh, the third, uh, third aspect, what I would like to talk about is the social capital and collective action. What we observe in Hungary is a very low level of unionization. This is not peculiar to Hungary. The unionization declined everywhere in, uh, in Europe after the Second World War. But in Hungary, the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, there was, uh, you, prior to the, uh, to the transition, there was a very large, very very extensive uh, unionization, but that was, uh, that was not a real uh, trade unionism, but existed that time. But, and most of these trade unions simply has been uh, discredited by their, uh, uh, by their practices and, uh, and also the other uh, social dialogue actors. And after the transition, the unionization went down to, to very low levels by European comparisons, much lower than in the core of the European Union. Trust in institution. institutions is, is among the lowest in, uh, in Europe, uh, and this is again uh, not new. It goes back, uh, goes back in history. Membership in civil organizations is uh, much lower than those of in, uh, uh, in uh, uh, Northern Europe, but also lower than in many of the continental European countries. Active help and care for the others is at lowest levels in, in Europe, and uh, there is a low level of trust towards uh, uh, politicians. If you go beyond, uh, behind these uh, uh, figures, then you will see that it correlates very, very highly with, uh, with corruption, corruption perception. So the uh, results are, are that uh, <coughs> around uh, four-fifths of the Hungarians uh, think that one cannot get rich without, uh, with, uh, with honest conduct in, uh, in, uh, in Hungary. Uh, around uh, three quarters um, think that getting ahead requires uh, breaking the rules. Uh, only one uh, in two persons believe that hard work takes, uh, takes us uh, where we uh, want to get, I mean getting ahead in the society. And uh, every fifth uh, Hungarian only believes that everyone has an equal chance to get ahead, and a very high proportion believes that having been born uh, to a proper family is a prep condition for, for getting ahead, which is clearly a sort of, uh, a, sign of uh, a sign of anomaly. But those uh, Hungarians can understand why did I put these two, uh, uh, two uh, uh, Hungarian writers at the bottom because they've been describing a society very much similar to these, uh, these attributes prior to the Second World War already. Okay, maybe this leads to the situation that the, uh, after uh, a long time, after the, uh, 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 the uh, transition, I mean in 2009, the Pew, Research, uh, Pew Global Attitude Survey has shown that uh, when we take a look at the change in the acceptance of capitalism and uh, uh, the comparisons of uh, the current status uh, as compared to the socialist times, many Hungarians uh, show signs of uh, bitterness and dis dis disillusionment uh, with what happened uh, in, the, uh, in the transition. 
Okay, the, what are the historic trends behind low trust and low social capital? Obviously, one very important uh, reason is that uh, this country never experienced long periods of democratic, uh, democratic uh, self-representation and democratic uh, uh, rules of the, uh, of, the, uh, of the game and democratic traditions. Uh, under uh, the communist periods, uh, the state took over what uh, shall have to be called solidarity but it was, it was not real solidarity, it was an enforced uh, coercion of uh, co co coercion uh, redistribution, and this uh, state-mastered solidarity crowded out the civilian solidarity from, uh, from, the, from the ordinary people. And uh, the, in, during the Qadar regime, there has been a double culture. Uh, uh, I mean, as, as we proceeded in time, more and more uh, development we have seen this, uh, of, of, this, uh, of this double culture, the difference between the formal and the informal spheres of life, the difference between the formal and informal speech and behavior. And uh, for some reasons this remained after the transition as well. Uh, the factors affecting to the development, development of uh, social capital, I uh, mentioned here three things. The, the, the one is the elite politics. I mean, after the transition, uh, the elite was uh, uh, mostly uh, dealing with its own problems, uh, distancing from rather than deep rooting into the, into the masses. So the political uh, changes were always from right from the beginning, a matter of someone distant from me uh, may not uh, sometimes not e even uh, uh, representing or voicing, uh, voicing my problems. You may be uh, debating that, maybe we can uh, get back to it uh, during the question and answer uh, session. <coughs> there has been a, a, an increasing polarization uh, in terms of partisanship and clientelism and welfareism in the society. This was not always here. It became stronger and stronger over time, especially in the last, uh, last uh, uh, decade. And there, there is a third factor, what I would call the elusive balances between constructive continuity and the toxic survivors, which is, uh, by that I mean that it, there, is, there is a value of uh, smooth transition in itself. But, uh, and it's, it's a good thing if, uh, if transition goes smoothly, people are not uh, imprisoned in, uh, you know, at, at the beginning of the transition, but it also has toxic consequences if there are no borderlines uh, uh, drawn uh, at the beginning. And the Hungarian transition was something like that. Uh, it, was a, it was a very uh, strange mix of, uh, of, continuity, of continuity and change. Uh, however, one would think that we, it's, uh, most of these things are Hungarian, but not. So if you take a look at uh, some sort of uh, maps of the uh, various, uh, of, of the European societies comparing to each other, then you would see, um, uh, this, this map shows uh, the uh, generalized, the level of generalized trust. The, the darker countries are where it is very high, the less dark countries where it is very low. This map shows uh, the uh, extent into which voluntary work is uh, done by the members of the, of the society. And this map shows uh, how people, what, what is the permissiveness towards homosexuality in the, uh, in the various countries. This map shows uh, the post-materialistic values, um, the acceptance of post-materialistic values. I don't want to speak of any of these uh, in detail, but what is interesting is the structure of the maps. You see that Hungary fits into a, uh, it's a, uh, well, it's, it's difficult to say it's the north of the south or the east of the west or the west of the east, but the certain position in almost, e almost each of these, uh, these maps appears. So there is a geographical uh, determination also of these. And finally, I would like to turn my last minute, two minutes maybe, uh, to issues of identity and geopolitical orientation. If one um, takes the, one of the most recent Eurobarometer surveys on how do people think about whom do they belong to, their own settlement, their own nation, then European Union and the Europe, then you would see uh, similar uh, 
uh, you, you would see uh, geographic air patterns showing that uh, the, at, at least at that time, the, uh, the majority of the Hungarians identified themselves to, to the Western, to the transatlantic, to the European, to the European Union, and many of these, uh, however you call uh, the, the, t the target for, for, uh, for identification. If you ask the Hungarians about whether they feel themselves to be citizens of the EU, then you find that again Hungary is somewhere in the middle and there is a fi fairly large acceptance of uh, uh, being uh, membership in the European Union. So there is a sort of European commitment when uh, geopolitical, uh, geopolitical and uh, European issues are at stake, uh, despite the fact that uh, the value structure in our hands uh, reminds most uh, towards, the, towards the East. Uh, however, if you ask uh, the Hungarians uh, which uh, countries, which, uh, which institutions uh, uh, do they think positively about, then again you would see that uh, uh, countries uh, belonging to the core of uh, the European uh, and transatlantic uh, group uh, receive a higher ranking and uh, the East uh, receives a lower ranking. If you think of uh, uh, how, where people want to move, where people want to migrate, then they tend to migrate towards the west, not towards the east. So it means that there is a sort of a, uh, a, a very interesting discrepancy when we cluster the Hungarians according to their uh, mindsets, then we are very much similar to the, to the Balkan and to the eastern countries. But when you, when you cluster the Hungarians uh, in terms of their uh, uh, wishes or dreams, where do we want to belong, then it's mostly the West. So I think uh, as a summary, I can, uh, I can summarize uh, some sort of worries and some sort of hopes. Uh, among the worries, uh, I mentioned the, the weak middle classes, the masses in deprivation, and the, well, I didn't speak too much about that, oligarchic tendencies in the society. Uh, among the worries, again, uh, we can speak of the, uh, the value structure of the Hungarians, but of, of course this, this just reflects uh, 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 a distribution uh, which, uh, which is prevalent in the neighboring countries as well as elsewhere in the geographic, geographic uh, proximity. And I spoke uh, less about the unsettled historic debates and the compromising interpretations of lessons from Soviet times which lead to the hypocrisy uh, in our current, uh, current uh, uh, lives in many, uh, many spheres. The hopes, I think the hopes are uh, in, uh, rooted in the, in the dreams of the Hungarians. I mean, they want to belong to the, to the, to the core of the European, um, uh, European uh, uh, community. Uh, the living standard appears is in the West and economic growth uh, hopefully sooner or later may raise the stakes for the middle classes so that they will try to defend their rights and ownership which can be a guarantee for the survival of, of, uh, of democracy. Uh, the uh, value structure, uh, I mean the orientations uh, uh, show westernizing sympathies and transatlantic commitment of the majority which is again a reinforcing and, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, room for hopes. And um, hopefully there will be generational change uh, where the, all these historical debates will fade away in the past. Uh, I don't expect any other good solutions to this. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>